Hello! Since it's very wintry at the moment, I thought I'd share with you a story from the second shepherd's play, which is one of the plays I studied in my book, Playtime. In the long winter, before Christmas was invented, three shepherds tended their sheep on the moors. It was freezing. The wind watered into their eyes, folded their legs into knots. The sheep shivered miserably under the crags. It's not since Noah's flood has such weather been seen in this bitter, brittle world. The shepherds huddled together and did what they did best. They moaned. They moaned about the tithes and the taxes, about corrupt government men, about landlords who cut their wages so hard the plough would never speed. They moaned about their wives. They also sang songs. And I don't know what their song was, but anyone who's been to Sheffield Carols will be able to tell you. But you'll get 50 different answers if you ask them what the tune is. But shh. While they were singing, someone else was sneaking across the moors. Someone wearing a, a rich, fur-trimmed cloak. Someone with a cocky swagger and a suspicious southern accent. Only two kinds of people would be out on a bitter night like this one. The first kind would be tending their sheep. The other kind would be trying to steal them. This stranger belonged to the second category of person and his name was Mac. A trickster and a thief. Mac was hungry and Mac was lean. Nobody in their right minds would trust Mac further than they could throw him. Even Mac's rich fur-trimmed cloak was stolen. He'd nicked it from a pageant wagon in York when its owner, King Herod, wasn't paying attention. Mac reckons he's wearing a cunning disguise as he storms into the shepherd's song circle like a tyrant on steroids. Of course, the shepherds all see through the disguise immediately. Mac, they say, what news? And to each other they whisper, Look to the sheep. He's certain to steal one of them if he can. But Mac drew himself up to his full height. What? he said. Who is this Mac fellow? I am the king's overseer. I demand your reverence. The three shepherds fall about laughing. Mac's southern accent is so overblown, he sounds like he's auditioning for Made in Chelsea. Now then, Mac, said the second shepherd, take out that southern tooth and stick it in a turd. There's nothing more embarrassing than someone carrying on with a disguise long after they've been recognised by their friends. What do you want? said the first shepherd. You after our sheep? Max sighed, took off his cloak. After your sheep, he says. Me? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, um, I'm, uh, I'm just looking for a comfortable place to sleep. The shepherds were not convinced. How about sleeping in your house? They asked. Ah, says Mac, it's too chaotic and noisy. My wife, she does nothing but eat and drink and bear children. He looked so woebegone that the shepherds ah, agreed that they might as well let him spend the night there. But they made him sleep between them, just to be sure he wasn't going to sneak off during the night. But Mac, Mac was lean and Mac was hungry and Mac had King Herod's cloak and a sound knowledge of the law of the land. And so when the shepherd settled down to sleep, he wriggled out of his place between them and replaced his sleeping form with the bundled up cloak. And then he spoke a spell over them. About you, a circle, as round as the moon, to do as I will until it is noon. There you must lie stone still. Over your heads, my hand, I spread right, out go your eyes, out go your sight. For he that lacks what he wants must take what he might. And the sleeping shepherds no longer felt the cold or the sleet. Their breathing became deeper, their snores rose in perfect harmony, bass, tenor, treble reverberating through the winter wind. <sighs> And Mac borrowed a sheep and vanished off into the night. 
Mac's wife, Jill, was, um, let's just say she was less than impressed when he arrived just before midnight dragging a very glumpy, sleet sodden sheep. The sheep shivered in their little house, dripping cold water all over the stone flagstones and bleating miserably. Meanwhile, Mac strode around with all the primeval pride of a hunter-gatherer. Mutton for dinner, he crowed. Aren't I a good husband? Jill looked at him. You, she said, you are the best kind of husband, for you'll get yourself hanged and leave me a merry widow. Come on. What happens when the shepherds come looking for him? Where do you think they're going to search for first? And Mac's face fell. For unlike the fearless coyote of the American plains, or the eloquent yarn-spinning Anansi, or the consummate bullshitter Reynard the Fox, Mac knew he only really belonged to an inferior class of trickster. Plus, unlike these other tricksters, Mac's neck is human, and exactly the right length for hanging. Well, 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 we'll have to hide him. Jill looks at her husband pityingly. Their cottage is a single stone room. It's no use for hiding anything. But she, at least, is clever. She took the soggy sheep and she swaddled its four feet in soft linen. Then she wrestled it gently into a cradle and covered it up with a snuggly blanket. Then she sent her husband back to the moor, telling him to lie down between the shepherds, pretend you've been asleep the whole time. The sheep, disguised as a baby, lies sulkily in the cradle. In its limited ovine theology, it vaguely wondered what sin it could possibly have committed to deserve such humiliating treatment. Out on the moor, the first shepherd woke up. The night was black, and he'd had an unsettling dream that he was lying next to a wolf in sheep's clothing. He felt a sudden urge to get up and go and count all of the sheep. He woke all his friends. But Mac? Mac carried on sleeping, his snores a little bit too loud and a little bit too fake. Shepherds poked him awake, and Mac sprang to his feet. Oh, friends, he said, I had this strange dream. My wife, my wife began to moan and groan and a baby boy was born. I must go to her. And he skittered off into the night. The shepherds were now very suspicious. They spun out across the moor and began the tedious business of counting their sheep. Three cold shepherds counting sheep, Yan tan tether mether pip they counted, Up near Wakefield steep and bleep, Yan tan tether mether pip they said. Having counted and recounted, none of them were very surprised to find a sheep missing. And rather than waste time searching under bushes and crags, they set off for the one place they felt sure to find it. As they approached the house, they heard a great din reverberating from inside. Jill was grunting and shouting and screaming as though in the throes of childbirth. Mac was singing a lullaby, loudly and completely out of tune. They were making so much noise it sounded as though Satan himself and all his best friends were having a nice tea party in that tiny cottage. The shepherds banged on the door. When Mac finally opened, they bundled into the house. Shh, said Mac, my baby boy is asleep. Where's our sheep? The shepherds demand. Oh, have, have you lost one? Says Mac. What a shame. If only I'd been there, the thief would have bought that sheep dearly. The fair shepherd wasn't impressed. You were there, Mac. A muffled noise comes from the cradle, but just at that second, Jill was overcome by a fit of groaning. <sighs> Mac put a hand protectively on his wife's shoulder. Friends, he said, if you suspect us, search our house, but I swear my wife has not risen since she first lay down here. 
Yes, agreed Gail, Jill. I swear to God, if ever I you beguiled, I will eat this child that lies in the cradle. <laughs> so the shepherds search everywhere. Every cupboard, every box, every corner, every nook and cranny. It doesn't take long. Mac and Jill are poor, their cottage really small. And all they can find is two empty platters. Feeling ashamed and a bit stupid, the shepherds apologise to Mac and Jill and leave the cottage. But as they trudged down the garden path, the second shepherd suddenly stopped. Gave you the child anything? He asked his friend. None of them have. And so he took a shiny sixpence from his pocket and went back into the cottage. Sorry, we doubted you, he said. Here, I have a silver sixpence for your little boy. But as he approached the cradle, both parents shouted out, Don't wake him, he's sleeping. When he wakes, he starts weeping. And the shepherd looked down at the boy in the cradle, and the boy in the cradle looked up at the shepherd. And the shepherd thought he'd never seen such an ugly lad in all his born days. Sure, the child had liquid, deep, intelligent brown eyes, but he was also um, quite a bit larger than he'd expect a newborn baby to be. And he had rich, white, curly hair that any great lord would be proud of. And he had a pair of horns peeping out from un under his bonnet. And what the devil is this? He's got a long snout. Mac and Jill make any number of excuses. Mac swears to the heavens that he got this child and Jill bore him. Jill swears that the boy was taken by an elf, that he was disfigured when the clock struck twelve. But when the shepherds found the sheep's ear tug, even Mac and Jill had to admit the game was up. Fortunately, they didn't fetch the judge or the noose. Instead, the shepherds took a blanket and tossed Mac, Mac up and down in it. Whoop! Boomp! Dunk! Whoop! Boomp! Dunk! Whoop! Dunk! Dump! Until Mac is as bruised and grumpy as the poor sheep. Back on their moor, the shepherds settled down to sleep again. And their breathing became deeper until their snores rose in perfect harmony. Bass, tenor, treble reverberating through the winter wind. But from what I hear, they didn't sleep for long. A light was gathering in the sky, and that light was called joy. And those three shepherds were jolted out of their sleep by a song from the heavens. And I don't know what that song was, but anyone who's been to Sheffield Carols will be able to tell you. But you'll get 50 different answers if you ask them what the tune is.